welcome to this iteration of our Transatlantic Dialogues, uh, which is a series of conversations with American experts and scholars on particular topics and on US foreign policy, uh, with which we at the Hague Center for Strategic Studies are trying to gauge both the range of views on US foreign policy, which is often much wider than is understood in Europe, and we're looking to kind of probe particular insights into US foreign policy and transatlantic relations as they pertain to particular topics. With us today is Professor Gregory Gauss, uh, Professor of International Affairs uh, and John Lindsay Chair at the Bush School of Government and Public Service at Texas A&M. Uh, he served as the head of the school's Department of International Affairs and he's an affiliate of the school's uh, Albert and Center for Grand Strategy. He has a wide range of experience and a wide range of publications on the Middle East uh, both in terms of books and articles, but with a particular focus on the Arabian Peninsula and politics in the Gulf. Welcome. My pleasure to be here. All right. So, uh, for someone, someone of my generation, uh, who sort of came of age in the in the in the wake of the the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003, and everything kind of became fascinated with international relations during the war on terror. Um, We've been talking about the Great Middle East for as a real topic for a good quarter century now, and argue actually much longer. So, what would you argue is at, is at the root of that that consistent set of conflicts, the instability? Uh, although this is of course a wide range of, of particular national contexts and so on, is this you know the, the story of oil and the outside interference of, of other mm -hmm. powers? Is it the, the multiple religions? What, what do you think is driving this instability? I'm not uh, convinced by the arguments that say it's either oil-based or that sectarianism drives these mm -hmm. conflicts. I think that since we've entered the 21st century, the real dynamic behind instability in the region has been the weakening and in many cases the collapse of authority domestically as states have been challenged either by external intervention, like Iraq was in 2003 when the United States invaded and destroyed the Iraqi state in the misbegotten notion that it could rebuild it from the ground up, or the Arab uprisings of 2011, which led to civil wars in Yemen and Syria and Libya. I think that, that the collapse of state authority created political vacuums into which local powers like Iran and uh, outside powers, like the United States, like Russia, have been able to intervene. And that, I think, has driven the, the geopolitical crisis. And I think the Gaza war is, uh, is just one more manifestation of how the collapse or weakening of state authority, in this case, the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank and Gaza, led to the rise of a non-state actor, the ability of outsiders like uh, Iran to intervene, and uh, set the stage for the current conflict. Right. Well, the, the 20 years ago, the, the answer to that for, from the US, from the rest of the, the Western world, to that instability in the, in the Middle East, uh, into that lack of you know, accountable states, that was very much the solution was to democratize it from the outside, both in Afghanistan, both in Iraq, or in Iraq. Um, yet, where did it exactly go wrong? Because that the idea then was to not have to deal constantly with a set of authoritarian leaders in stable states, but also very oppressive states that bred their own kind of source of resentment. Did it go wrong with the idea of democratization? Should, we, should the West have stuck with dealing with authoritarian leaders? Or is it just particularly poor at understanding non-state actors and groups? All of the above. Uh, okay. I think that, that uh, there was a very popular diagnosis in the post 9-11 period in the United States among the political class and not just the neoconservatives that the cause of 9-11 had to be uh, something much larger than just a, if you will a lucky punch mm -hmm. by a, a small group uh, al-Qaeda uh, and and there was this notion that that uh, the, the origins of 9-11 of were in the repression of political dissent and political voice in the Muslim world that if you had democracies, you wouldn't have terrorist groups. I thought this was naive at the time, and it has proven to be otherwise. Uh, elections, I don't think, work unless you have a society 
where you have a stable state that can in mm -hmm. fact govern, and when the stakes of politics aren't I enormous, mm -hmm. right? Because you have to be willing as a loser in, a, in an electoral system mm -hmm. to accept the outcome. But if you are in a situation where you are reformulating the whole political order and, and your group loses, well, you feel like you could be cut out forever. And thus, we saw in Iraq uh, the rise of, of Sunni militancy in the aftermath of the, of the original elections after the American invasion. And in, in Afghanistan, we, we never, we, the United States, never really reconstituted a state that could be a stable basis for a democratic system. Mm. Well, we've seen some Western examples of where it's been difficult to accept the outcome of elections as well. Right. And we've uh, also seen Western examples, democratic states, where uh, individual terrorist and small terrorist mm -hmm. groups have emerged. I mean, that was, that was European politics in the 70s. Yes. In the United States, we have a monument in, in Oklahoma City to the death of uh, you know, over 100 people in a, mm -hmm. in a bombing by a domestic terrorist. Right. I think very often we've forgotten how long and bloody... American and European history was, and that takes a lot of effort to get to the point where democracy uh, ameliorates all these uh, internal pressures. Mm -hmm. So, if the failure of the democratization is apparent, and that's that's I think apparent in in all the presidencies that followed mm -hmm. George W. Bush, which have all in different ways tried to extract the U.S. from the from the Middle East, also with the eye of putting more intellectual, financial, military resources aiming at that at, at the Asia-Pacific, then right. the Indo-Pacific. Um, why has it proven so hard to, to diminish that role in the Middle East? And, and is that something intrinsic about U.S. objectives, or is it a certain set of ideology? Or what? I think that there are a couple of, of things. There are some very uh, specific material interests that the United States has in the region, and they revolve largely around oil and mm -hmm. energy. And, and we saw when the Biden administration came in, they wanted to distance themselves from Saudi Arabia and the belief that the United States was quote unquote energy independent now and the Saudis just weren't that important. Mm -hmm. And we saw that when the Ukraine war started and the energy markets uh, soared, uh, the need in the Biden administration to reach out to the Saudis as the largest exporter of oil in the world. So that energy interest is still there. And we have, I think, a, a profound and, and bipartisan commitment within the American political system to Israel. And that's a domestic political issue. I don't think that there's a, a real strategic logic behind it. Certainly since the end of the Cold War, I don't think there, there's a strategic mm -hmm. logic around it, but it is uh, part and parcel of the, Ameri the American political system. So the United States is going to be involved, and we see that in the Gaza war now. Right, the war, in, uh, the war between Israel and Hamas started at the time of recording exactly two months ago. Mm -hmm. um, the U.S. has tried to, to manage the Israeli behavior, uh, the behavior of, of regional states, yet it seems that American influence over Israel is quite limited, and it's not, it's not exactly new either. So why is that? Why, despite all the effort, all the energy, all the, the transfers of arms and so on, sales of arms, why is that proven so difficult? Well, I think it's just because uh, Israel is, has such support on a bipartisan basis in the United States. Uh, we saw uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu try to go behind and around the Obama administration, for example, on the Iran nuclear deal and on other issues and appeal directly to Obama's opposition, the Republicans. And so there's, there's this ability of Israel, because of its deep support in the United States, to play into the domestic politics of the United States in the way that very, very few other countries can do. And I think that that, that kind of explains why uh, one would think that all of the aid, all of the political support, the military support the United States provides to Israel doesn't lead to an ability of the United States to kind of call the shots for Israel. So do you think that this is going to change? This precisely as a function of going around of, of this Israeli government playing very partisan uh, politics in the U.S. Uh, we've also seen in a variety of protests on behalf of Palestinians, uh, mostly located uh, at elite universities. Do you think that there's a change in American policy regarding Israel forthcoming? I don't see a, a change in policy coming. I, I, I do think that the mobilization uh, on behalf of Palestinian rights 
is uh, probably the one unique thing coming out of this crisis in, the, in terms of U.S. politics. We really haven't seen that before, but we have to acknowledge that it's still very limited. Uh, and overwhelmingly, uh, American public opinion is pro-Israeli, the Republican Party really almost exclusively pro-Israeli, the Democratic Party beginning to see some uh, emergence of, of a counter-argument to that, but again, not a majority even within the Democratic Party. I think Biden took a very different approach to Netanyahu than Obama did. Mm -hmm. Obama kept him at arm's length. Biden has uh, embraced Netanyahu, particularly in the aftermath of October 7th, I think with the strategic idea that that would give him more leverage, more ability to affect Netanyahu's mm -hmm. uh, behavior during the course of the conflict. And also, to be honest, Biden's impulse is to, is to embrace the Israelis. He's been in politics, remember, mm -hmm. in the United States since the 1970s. Uh, we're going to see if that works, because we, we are getting indications that the U.S. is pressing Netanyahu uh, to limit the civilian casualties and to, to develop a, a realistic end game for when sure. this conflict is going to be over. So Biden is trying to pressure the Israeli government to get that, that American attempt to, to shape Israeli behavior, to, sh to shape Palestinian behavior. It goes, well, it goes back very far. but, but it, what was interesting is that even during the 90s, uh, during the period of essentially unchallenged U.S. power, when there was no, there were, Russia had collapsed, right. China had not yet risen, um, that even then it proved very difficult. So that leads into a larger question of now that the world is more competitive, I don't, the, world competi the, the word right. competition is overused at this point, right. great power competition, but still the world is more competitive, Russia is playing a role in, in the Middle East, uh, Putin has been received, despite all the you know, the way he's been ostracized in Europe and the right. U.S. He has been received with all uh, regards in the UAE and, and uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, China is playing a larger role in the Middle East. How should we understand the long term or short term and the long term effects of this kind of the Middle East being more in play than before? Right. I, I mean, I think that the failure of the Clinton administration to uh, achieve the peace agreements that it wanted to between Israel and the Palestinians, Israel and Syria was, was a great failure of, uh, you know, during that unique time when the United States was unchallenged in the world and had enormous influence in the Middle East as a result of the Gulf War of 1990-91. Uh, so that was a failure and I think that we can attribute it to, in part to the Clinton administration's unwillingness to push the Israelis when it finally got to you know, the time to, to, to sign on the dotted line, particularly on the Syrian front. That's a historical question. I think that the changes in, in the, the global balance of power, if you will, uh, the, I don't know if we want to say the emergence of bipolarity quite yet or multipolarity, but certainly within the region itself, the regional states are reaching out to Russia, they're reaching out to China in an attempt to give themselves options in an attempt to, in some cases, balance the United States and the United States' as allies. I don't think it makes that much difference for the Gaza war because the Chinese really don't, they seem to have no interest in getting involved in, in the Arab-Israeli element in the Middle East. The Russians have been rather cautious as well. Uh, but I do think that the, the Putin visit to the UAE and Saudi Arabia brings us back to energy because I think what he's talking about with the Saudis is the continuing fall in the price of oil, despite the fact that both Russia and Saudi Arabia have cut back, or at least committed to cut back. The Saudis have cut back. The Russians have committed to cut back mm -hmm. on production. And I think that, that that's one of those uh, ties that keeps the Russians not central to the Middle East, but keeps them involved in the Middle East, and keeps the Saudis wanting to maintain a relationship mm -hmm. with Putin because they know they can't manage the world oil market, if they can manage it at all, without Russian cooperation. Mm. The Chinese, I think, are the big question mark here. Uh, they've basically been an economic actor in the Middle East, and as such have tried to maintain good relations with everybody. Mm. They want to buy oil from Saudi Arabia and the Emirates, but they also want to buy oil from Iran. They want to sell their products in the Gulf. They want to sell them to Israel, mm. military and, and commercial. And so in that sense, I, I think that the Chinese are are kind of on the cusp of having to decide whether they just want to be a commercial power in the Middle East or whether they want to be involved more politically. And, and that'll be, I think, a really important 
indicator of where the region is going to go. Right. And which is, you know, Be Beijing's decision making on this is, I think, still largely a black box. Mm -hmm. um, much of your research has focused on, on Saudi Arabia, on, the, on a monarchy. And the, the US Saudi relationship was always, if not maybe happy, with rather stable. Mm -hmm. uh, in the last few years, it has started evolving uh, as, the, as the prince has drawn more power to himself. Um, and now there's, if we look at this administration and the Trump administration, there's been kind of a weird irony in there where Trump, on the one hand, Trump's uh, the Trump family yeah. had very close ties uh, to Saudi Arabia, but uh, Trump was also reluctant to commit resources to protect Saudi Arabia when it was attacked, the oil fields were attacked in late uh, 2019. Mm -hmm. Biden, as you already mentioned, uh, in the wake of the, the murder of Khashoggi, was very reluctant to, to work with, actually was going to, to punish Saudi mm -hmm. Arabia, has now moved away, n not just moved away from that, but has come close to making security guarantees mm -hmm. to Saudi Arabia. To, how, how should we place this? What, where is this story arc heading? Right. Well, I think from the Saudi perspective, uh, what I hear when I'm in the kingdom is, uh, don't make us choose between you and China. Right. Right? We can't choose in that relationship because China is our largest customer, which is absolutely true. By massive factor. By massive factor, yeah. China is the largest purchaser of Saudi oil, also the largest purchaser of Iranian oil. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think Emirati oil as well. Uh, so the Saudis you know, have to maintain a relationship with China. That's the way they understand their interest. And, and to a lesser extent, that's why they, they have to maintain a relationship with Russia. Not because they sell to Russia, but because the management of the market depends on Russian cooperation. Uh, I think from the United States perspective, there, there was one kind of idea floating around in the political class in the United States that with the enormous increase in American oil production in the 2000s, that uh, the Middle East wouldn't be as important and Saudi Arabia wouldn't be as important because America was quote unquote energy independent. But what I think that idea misunderstood is that the United States was never interested in the Middle East because we got a lot of oil we, the United States, got a lot of oil from the Middle East. It's because oil is a world market and, and the price, you know, price changes ripple through the system immediately. And because American friends and allies in Europe, in East Asia, Japan, the East Asian mm -hmm. states do rely on oil from the, from the Persian Gulf region. And so it, it's important even if the United States doesn't get one drop of oil mm -hmm. from the Middle East. Uh, and, and the Biden administration woke up to that fact when the Ukraine war started and energy prices went way up. Mm -hmm. So um, moving from Saudi Arabia to, to Iran, Iran through, through several of its proxies, particularly the Houthis, has played, um, has reacted to, mm -hmm. to the Israel-Hamas war with uh, the Houthis attacking Israel, attacking ships that have been mm -hmm. passing through the Red Sea. So far, the U.S. reaction to that has been fairly restrained, I would say. Um, is that related to any hope of revitalizing the Iran deal, the GCPOA? Or is that completely disconnected? Is, has that bridge been burned already? I think the Biden administration might harbor long-term, second-term hopes for some return to a nuclear negotiation with Iran. But in the short term, I think it's off the table. I think that, that the restraint that the United States is showing, vis-a-vis -vis the Houthis particularly, uh, also vis-a-vis -vis the Iranian allied militias in Iraq and mm -hmm. Syria that have you know, increased their, their attacks on the small number of American forces yes. in those places. I think it, it, it's based on a desire not to see this conflict spread. I think they want to de-escalate, not escalate. Uh, and I think the Iranians are trying to, they're trying to find what that line is because they want mm -hmm. to be able to say and demonstrate that they're the leaders of the axis of resistance, as they call it, the, the only regional state that really is supporting the Palestinians. And so they have their proxies and their allies kind of push Hezbollah on Israel's northern border, uh, the, the, the Houthis, mm -hmm. the militias in Iraq and Syria, pushing to, to be able, so the Iranians can portray themselves as taking an active role in support of the Palestinians, but without getting up to that line where the United States might actually react against them. So they're playing, I think, a, a very, uh, it could be a dangerous game in this right. case, and, and, and mostly for, for propaganda benefits. Right, because 
if they go too far, there could still be a U.S. Sure. response to it. You mentioned the Biden, the Biden administration playing the game with the Iran deal for maybe the second term. So if they win re-election, then they feel they would have enough leeway to maybe try to reinvigorate the deal? Or is that basically just um, dead in the water already? I think that there are enough people in the administration who are involved in the first deal, mm-hmm. uh, including Jake Sullivan, the National Security mm-hmm. Advisor, who helped negotiate the, the first JCPOA, that, that there will be a desire on the part of the Biden administration in a second term, if it gets a second term, after the, the fallout of the Gaza war has, has subsided somewhat, to at least investigate what the prospects are. Now, this is a very different Iranian government than the Iranian government that signed the JCPOA. This is an Iranian government that that is in some ways a reaction against the government that signed the JCPOA. Much more hardline, much much closer to the to the supreme leader who is, you know, unapologetic in his view that America is an enemy of Iran. And also in a different context, right? The Obama administration was able to get UN sanctions on Iran that led the Iranians to the negotiating table. Uh, I can't imagine Russia and China agreeing to sanctions on Iran in the current global atmosphere, uh, and thus the Iranians don't have to worry about that kind of, of, of broad international front pushing them to the negotiating table. Right. So your, your first answer, it's not just about oil and energy, but energy, is, it's, it's, it's inextricably linked yes. to all the outside involvement, to the inside uh, to the regional politics, to domestic politics in, in some of the key states. So European governments, and certainly the c- center and center-left parties, have really committed themselves, uh, I think across the board, to the energy transition, uh, to move away from fossil fuels towards more sustainable resources. So maybe as a, as a final question, if they succeed at this, does that mean that the Middle East sort of evaporates as a geopolitical concern, that, that this conversation in a decade, in two decades, would not happen? I think we will pay much less attention to the Middle East if, in fact, we can get to the energy transition that, that uh, many people hope we can. Uh, unfortunately, I don't see substantive movement on that front right now. Uh, if you look at the oil industry, uh, the major oil producers are, are talking about producing more, not less oil, and talking about the multinational mm-hmm. oil companies. Even though some state oil companies like Saudi Aramco might reduce production temporarily to try to support prices, uh, you see more wells being drilled, whether it's domestically in the U.S., whether it's in Latin America, Guyana, mm-hmm. Brazil. Uh, it seems like the, the appetite for petroleum is, is not going to go down anytime soon. Perhaps we'll see a technological breakthrough that might change this. And if that happens, and if the world demand for energy decreases substantially, I think that world attention to the energy center uh, of the Persian Gulf will also decrease. Could that be an end or at least a decline of conflict and instability? It could, but it could also cut the other way. I mean, if these states in the Persian Gulf, which have lived on oil and and since the 1970s have become rich because of oil, all of a sudden see their their status and their economic status and their political status decline, that could lead some to say, well, we've, you know, the only way for us to to keep it going is to take over the oil fields in our neighbor. Uh, And and you do have, obviously, some uh, relatively vulnerable states Kuwait, as we saw in 1990, mm-hmm. could be could be captured in a in a day by Iraq, by mm-hmm. a, an Iraq uh, that's unified and has a big army, uh, and so I, I don't think that it's a formula for the end of conflict in the region, but it is a formula for a much reduced uh, element of intervention from the outside. Right. So it's not the end to the the frustration with these big ambitions that were there. 20 years ago, 25 mm-hmm. years ago, but at least at a more, in a more limited scale. Right. Right. Well, Professor Gauss, I would like to thank you again for your presence here and for answering these questions. It was very illuminating. My pleasure. Thank you.